Welcome. It's my pleasure to have you here tonight for our annual research grant announcement. Over the next 90 minutes, we'll hear about the areas of Duchenne muscular dystrophy research, our research investment framework, updates on innovative approaches currently being funded, and finally, we'll meet the brilliant minds behind the newly funded research projects. Before we begin, I want to thank all of our donors, our sponsors, fundraisers, who have given and continue to give to our organization. Defeat Duchesne Canada does not receive government funding, so relies solely on the commitment and generosity of our community to fund the most promising science that you'll hear about tonight. Together, we are transforming lives and inspiring hope. I thank you very much for that. For those of you who are newer to Defeat to Shame Canada, our story started back in 1995 when John and Jesse Davidson from London, Ontario, set a momentous vision of future without the shame. In 2022, our name changed to Defeat Duchenne Canada, but while the name changed, our mission and vision remain the same. Defeat Duchenne Canada is the country's only national charity solely dedicated to ending Duchenne muscular dystrophy and we remain steadfast in our four main areas of work, research, education and support, advocacy and community engagement. But why do we do this? We do it so children and young adults like 16 year old Emery, who was featured in our 2023 year end campaign can live longer, stronger lives. And we do it for every single person affected by this disease until no one is. Let's hear from Emery. I was never one of those little kids who jumped off the back of the sofa. I didn't run or jump like other kids. When I was almost five, I had a ruptured appendix, which led to a lot of tests. That's when we learned that I have Duchenne muscular dystrophy. It's not easy having Duchenne. My muscles are weaker than my 14-year-old friends. I'm really short because of my steroid treatment. Life is less predictable with Duchenne. But I'm a fighter. Duchenne may limit my mobility, but it doesn't limit my imagination and my determination. And I'm even stronger knowing I have a whole community behind me. My family, friends, researchers, medical professionals, fundraisers, and volunteers. They're fighting for me. They're fighting for all the boys and young men with Duchenne. Join the fight! Please donate and help us defeat Duchenne. So now that you're hopefully all thoroughly inspired, um, let's get into the meat of why we're here tonight. And to kick things off, I'd like to introduce Dr. Hans Lockmuller. Dr. Lockmuller, among other things, is a neuromuscular specialist and senior scientist at the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, CHEO, and professor of neurology at the University of Ottawa. He is a board member with Defeat to Shen Canada and also a member of the Research Funding Advisory Committee that played a key role in selecting this year's research grant recipients. While some research strategies that you'll hear about tonight are aimed at correcting the root cause of uh, Duchenne or restoring or replacing dystrophin, other methods aim at reducing the symptoms of the disease and the organs that they affect, like the heart, lungs, brain, skeletal, and smooth muscle. To help us better understand tonight's speakers and their work, we've asked Dr. Lockmuller to provide a brief overview of the areas of Duchenne research. Welcome Dr. Lockmuller and over to you. Thanks Lisa. Uh, first, let me say uh, thank you for having me at this uh, celebration uh, and this fantastic event that Defeat Duchenne has put up and to hear about uh, the 
uh, successful grants tonight is is, is uh, particularly rewarding, uh, also for me as part of the uh, science committee and the board. Uh, if you uh, want to move on the slide, I'll give you a bit of background uh, to uh, have a better understanding of uh, what the uh, scientific basis is of uh, what we're talking uh, for the rest of the night. Uh, so the dystrophin gene is a large gene on the X chromosome. Uh, it has uh, 79 uh, exons uh, that are transcribed in uh, a messenger RNA, and that's then translated into the dystrophin protein. And in Duchenne, uh, there is a genetic fault uh, of the dystrophin gene uh, that's leading uh, to uh, a similar fault in the mRNA and usually to the complete absence of the dystrophin protein. Uh, so the protein is here depicted with this red color on this muscle cross section on the right lower side of the slide. So uh, every Duchenne boy has their own uh, mutation in the dystrophin gene. So they don't all have exactly the same uh, mutation uh, this could be affecting one of the early uh, exons or, or the later exons and a combination of those. Uh, therefore, any attempt to uh, correct the gene itself, which is now possible through a, a technology called CRISPR, uh, is uh, very specific to the individual a boy or the mutation, or sometimes a group of boys. And, and similar so uh, when we try to uh, correct the mRNA, uh, so there's usually uh, specific uh, uh, therapeutic agents that target a, a group of boys with a specific uh, mutation in the same region, uh, so-called antisense oligonucleotides for exon skipping. Uh, there's, of course, then, uh, the dystrophin protein itself, and I think there's no therapy so far that uh, sort of has uh, provided dystrophin protein to the muscle directly. But then there's, of course, a number of things uh, that happen downstream to the lack of dystrophin protein, uh, and that is common to all boys with uh, Duchenne. So those uh, therapies that address those downstream events, uh, they are potentially uh, uh, working uh, for for all boys uh, with Duchenne and not just for a, a smaller subgroup with a certain mutation. If you move on to the next slide now, please. So this is uh, what uh, muscle uh, looks like. Uh, the upper panel is a normal muscle with uh, muscle fibers that are all about the same size uh, and, and they're uh, there's not much space in between these muscle fibers. Uh, all, all the red color is muscle, basically. Well, just below uh, the Duchenne muscle, uh, the fibers are uh, a, a lot more diverse in terms of their size and their... Uh, uh, in, in fibers, uh, the lot... Uh, uh, tissue is uh, fibrous tissue, so uh, this means there's some scarring going on, and the white is some some lipid uh, accumulation in the muscle, uh, and uh, a, a lot of small blue uh, cells, uh, and these are inflammatory. A lot of the therapies that are aiming uh, to uh, downstream of the dystrophin deficiency uh, support the muscle are actually against those inflammatory cells uh, and, and steroids are, are, are some of the agents that we already use in clinic. Uh, the next slide, please. So this is a scheme that sort of uh, shows what I've just uh, tried to explain. Uh, so the different treatment approaches uh, look at uh, different uh, uh, parts of the uh, events that uh, lead to Duchenne. Uh, so the gene itself, uh, uh, with uh, what we call now genome editing, uh, that is usually a, a one-off therapy. And uh, hopefully, if it restores, then uh, uh, at least there is a, a functioning uh, dystrophin gene available uh, for those muscle fibers that are corrected. 
then uh, the RNA and the dystrophin protein. So these uh, treatment approaches with antisense oligonucleotides, they, they would need to be repeated uh, uh, regularly every few weeks through an infusion. And then those uh, various treatments that address the downstream effects like the scarring uh, as well as the inflammation or uh, just strengthening the muscle, uh, those could be oral uh, therapies to, to, to tablets that need to be taken regularly. Next slide, please. For, for all these approaches, of course, uh, uh, fantastic scientists have uh, looked at these and uh, developed new ideas, and you will hear more about this during the course of the evening. Uh, so this is the preclinical uh, studies that we need to do first uh, in the labs and uh, with some animal models before it can, before it's considered safe enough to test those uh, new molecules and new approaches in what's called clinical trials, uh, where uh, in a sort of staged approach from phase one to phase three, uh, it is assessed whether a, a new treatment is safe and efficacious before it can be approved and be provided, uh, hopefully, through the healthcare systems and in the countries, uh, including uh, for us, uh, Health Canada approval. Uh, so this may often take uh, a number of years from, from preclinical science to, to clinical trials to approval, but uh, the encouraging uh, 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 aspect is that uh, in the meantime, over the last few years, more and more discoveries came out of the labs that led to more and more clinical trials. So we're not just talking about one clinical trial now, there are several ongoing and uh, hopefully uh, some of these uh, drugs will be approved in Canada and be made accessible to patients with Duchenne. And poss possibly there might be even a, a combination of treatments and not every treatment is the right thing for every boy. So there might be different treatments for different stages of the disease. So I end here with my introductory remarks and hand back to Lisa. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Lockmuller. Um, that's very helpful. So now at Defeat Duchenne Canada, we know that research is the only way to find a cure and to improve and to improve care. But we cannot do this alone. It is truly a partnership with scientists, clinicians, and families working closely together to serve one common purpose, to improve the health and quality of life for individuals living with Duchenne and Becker muscular dystrophy. We do this by building a pipeline of new innovative science and medicines for Duchenne and Becker through our research grant competition. Our process starts with an international call for research applications, which we call letters of intent. Our research, and Duchesne Family Advisory Committees, made up of volunteers from across the country, then review and rank the submissions, inviting the top projects to submit a full application. The full applications are then reviewed by the research and Duchesne Family Advisory Committees and ranked against this year's criteria. The final selections are then brought to the Board of Directors for funding approval. As said previously, we cannot do this alone and we rely on the expertise, knowledge and lived experience of our volunteers who rigorously analyze the science and its potential from start to finish. I wish to take a moment to thank our 2023 Research Funding Advisory Committee members, Dr. Lisa Hoffman, who serves as uh, committee chair from London, Ontario, Dr. Ch Jeff Chamberlain from Seattle, Washington, Dr. Hernan Gorazowski from Toronto, Ontario, and Hans Lockmuller from Ottawa, Ontario, Dr. Jean Ma from Calgary, Alberta, and Dr. Toshifumi Yokoda from Edmonton, Alberta. At this time, just like to take a moment to offer a very special thank you to one of our departing volunteers, Dr. Jeff Chamberlain. 
Dr. Chamberlain, your invaluable expertise and visionary contributions have been instrumental to our research funding advisory committee over the past eight years. Your groundbreaking work on the development of the MDX mouse and gene therapy for Duchenne, along with your extensive research in other muscular dystrophies have solidified your reputation as a world-class mm -hmm. leader mm -hmm. in the field. Your guidance and advice have played a crucial role in shaping the research funding initiatives of Defeat Duchenne, formerly Jesse's Journey, ultimately impacting the lives of children and young adults worldwide. So as a token of our appreciation, please accept this plaque symbolizing our deep gratitude for your unwavering dedication to our mission. Your contributions extend far beyond our organization. They resonate with the entire Canadian Duchesne community. Your selflessness is truly cherished and recognized by all of us. Thank you so much, Dr. Chamberlain. And also thank you to our families across Canada who give their time throughout the year in collaboration with the Research Funding Advisory Committee to ensure that the funds they help raise are invested into projects that will make the biggest difference to them, their family, and families around the world. Thank you. Lori Power, Chair from Sydney, Nova Scotia. Carrie Denisick from Sask Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Nicole Matheson, from Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. Kasha Mitten from Kamloops, BC. Darlene and Eric Morden from Oakville, Ontario. Rachel Witzke from Aikenville, Ontario. And Nicola Warsfeld from Toronto, Ontario. You have done a great service. It's now my pleasure to introduce Rick Moss, our Director for Strategic Partnerships. Thank you, Lisa. Good evening, everyone, and thank you very much for joining us. Right now, we have seven researchers currently in years two and three of their funding from De Defeat Duchenne Canada, and we've invited them here tonight to provide an update on the progress of their work. We ask that you have, if you have any questions for these researchers, the easiest way to access them is by email at info at defeatduchenne.ca. That's info at defeatduchenne.ca. And we'll forward your email to the appropriate speaker. I'd like to begin by introducing Dr. Kunkel from Boston Children's Hospital. Dr. Kunkel, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, I'm sharing my screen and setting this up. Okay, I'm going to talk today about our novel approach to DMD centered on the notch pathway to modulate muscle stem, stem cells. So this is a, a collaborative effort between my lab with Felipe uh, de Suzalite and Mayana Zatz's lab and Joyce Epicito. Um, and this this comes about from two different directions. First, our studies from in, with Mayanna Zatz on a golden retriever who, whose some of the dogs in her colony escaped dystrophin deficiency and lived a normal lifespan. Those dogs increased the level of JAG1 in their muscle. And we were able to show that in zebrafish, and now I'll show you tonight, in mice, you can improve outcome by increasing JAG1 expression. In addition, the Zatz laboratory also came across and identified two patients unrelated to one another who were boys with Duchenne, no, no dystrophin, yet lived into their late 20s, into their 30s, were ambulatory for much longer. We did sequencing and genomics on those two different patients and came up with variant, sequence variants in the NOTCH3 gene. So to test this, we decided to, to set up mouse models 
of each of these two different systems. We made a an MDX mouse carrying the, one of the Notch 3 variants, and we made a MDX mouse overexpressing human JAG1 in their striated muscles. The JAG1 expressing mice had stronger muscles as shown by this uh, slide here. The blue lines show that they have increased strength. The muscles were also larger. We did the same thing, and, and it's in the progress right now, on the Notch 3 mice. We've done histology, open field tests, fatigue tests, rotor rod, startle response, and we're in the process of doing uh, ex vivo physiology and histology and a few more things. But our original indications are that these mice as well have improved motor function and muscle size. What are we doing? Where, what else have we done? We've done molecular consequences. That is, what is the interaction between Notch 3 and JAG1 in vivo? In, in vitro, I mean. Um, we've looked, we've derived IFS, I, IPS lines from each of these different patients. Uh, we've set up isogenic lines and we're in the process of sorting these. Our progress is to publish the JAG1 paper, which is actually a publication almost ready to be submitted. We're finishing our Notch 3 data collection. We plan to publish that. We want to translate these findings. But we're also in the process of discussions with Biopharma to try to translate these findings into places where we can move this forward into patients. This could not have been done without the support of Defeat Duchenne, as well as other institutes, including the National Institutes of Health. And I would be remiss, remiss to not acknowledge the other people who contributed to this study who are listed in this slide. And I hope I did my little spiel in the three or four minutes allotted. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kunkel. And now I'll turn it over do to Dr. Michael Rudnicki from the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute in Ottawa. Michael? Good evening, everybody. And uh, thank you for uh, participating tonight. Uh, okay. I'm just sharing my screen. Okay, how is that? Can you, everyone see my screen? It's good. Thank you. So, um, um, Defeat Duchesne funded a project in our lab a couple of years ago now where we are exploring a very novel uh, delivery system of a protein called WINT7A. WINT7A, uh, as you can see on the left, um, has a very powerful effect on, on regeneration in skeletal muscle. Uh, it's a natural protein that's secreted uh, during muscle damage that um, uh, mobilizes muscle stem cells, uh, stimulates their migration, and also acts directly on the myofiber, myofiber to, to enhance strength. And uh, we've shown that uh, uh, intramuscular injection of this protein um, uh, really has a profound effect on muscular dystrophy uh, and makes the muscles stronger and, and um, through stimulation of regeneration and acting on the muscle fiber, really uh, dampers down uh, the, the muscular dystrophy phenotype. Um, this is protein is secreted, so it acts like a, like a hormone, but the protein itself is, is very, very insoluble, and, and it, you can't inject it into the blood system to, to go across the body. Um, uh, so the, the way we're attempting to address that is to make use of the natural biology of this protein. So we discovered that WIN7A is normally secreted not as a free protein, but is secreted out of cells uh, attached to the outside surface of small extracellular uh, vesicles. These are also called exosomes. So they, during muscle damage, um, newly formed muscle fibers secrete these little particles uh, with WIN7A on them at very, very high levels. And then these travel to muscle stem cells and to regenerating fibers and in a feed forward way, really enhance the, the uh, regeneration process. And you can see on this electron micrographs, uh, here are some of these um, uh, EVs or extracellular vesicles on these black dots are WIN7A sitting on the surface. And we can make 
uh, exosomes with WIN78 or without WIN78 and show that they have uh, that those with WIN78 have very nice bioactivity at, at stimulating myofiber uh, growth in a in a petri dish. Uh, now, uh, the critical experiment, of course, is to do this in mice. So uh, we have to use a, a, a very complicated protocol to, called uh, tangential flow filtration that we developed to purify very pure preparations of these these exosomes. We uh, inject them into the into the uh, circulation in the blood system of mice that, that have received an injury, and these are MDX mice that have uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. But there are also mice that uh, lack WIN7A in muscle, so that they are a sensitized responder for anything that we inject. Now, normally to see an, an effect in an MDX mouse, we have to inject two micrograms of WIN7A protein directly into the muscle. Here, we've only injected a, about 700 nanograms uh, into the tail vein of where it goes through the entire body of these mice. And this just shows you the force being generated by these this regenerating muscle in the MDX mouse. And we can see a 50% increase in, in the, the, the force generation, really showing that we've accelerated an augmented regeneration, which is deficient uh, in these uh, dystrophic mice. But we also looked in the diaphragm, which wasn't injured with cardiotoxin, and we can see a dramatic difference in the, in the um, uh, appearance of the muscle. So in, in the diaphragms and the control mice, we see these big areas of, of uh, fibro fibrosis throughout the muscle. And we, we really don't see that in the mice that were treated for win 7 a EVs. So we're now extending this work by uh, ramping up the manufacture of this material uh, so that we can just uh, treat regular mice. But in, this, in the second part of the project, we're also uh, engineering WIN7A so that it has uh, enhanced activity and enhanced targeting uh, specificity. Uh, and this is uh, by using two different proteins. Uh, one part is WIN7A and the other part is a protein that will enhance targeting to muscle and enhance WIN7A activity. Uh, and right now we are we are taking this through a series of biochemical tests to, to um, ask whether or not it's behaving in an enhanced way, and it sure looks like it is. And then we're going to move it through all the uh, different sorts of tests to evaluate this. And the notion is, is that this could become a therapeutic that could be delivered to patients, uh, perhaps on a weekly or monthly basis, that would then uh, uh, prevent and slow progression of Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So that's the project funded by Defeat Duchesne. I'd like to close um, with just giving you a, a very, very short update on, on the work being pursued by Satellus Bioscience. Uh, I should disclose that uh, I'm a, I'm a uh, scientific founder uh, and I'm the chief development officer, so I'm in a conflict of interest, so you probably shouldn't believe anything I'm saying, but we have some really exciting news. So we've developed drugs that target the notch pathway that was was uh, previously described by Lou and they really have a, 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 a quite a profound effect in, in mobilizing muscle stem cells and stimulating regeneration. Uh, these drugs now are um, uh, and the clinical candidate is moving into phase one clinical trials that's a safety test uh, which will take place uh, in in um, uh, uh, spring summer of this year. And by early 2025, we will be in phase two clinical trials. Uh, and um, this is a very exciting development. And uh, I, I certainly look forward to opening, um, uh, having Canadian sites open where we can treat patients in Canada. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rudnicki. Next is Dr. Nicholas Benson from the University of Washington in Seattle. Dr. Benson, over to you. Hello, everyone. I'm going to share my screen here. I'm going to give you a brief update here of my uh, uh, presentation here. It's uh, my, my project to generate regulatory cassette that we can use to edit uh, the dystrophin gene in muscle stem cells. So what is the impact of skeletal muscle turnover on gene therapy, such as the AAV microdystrophin or even CRISPR treatments of adult muscle, where we deliver AV vectors to restore dystrophin expression in these fibers to stabilize them? However, with time and during growth and maintenance of injury, there is a risk 
that there might be some turnover in these muscles that could lead to a gradual therapeutic loss. Now, if we could go in and edit muscle stem cells using AV, we could correct the dystrophy mutation directly. Then those cells, in response to maintenance or injury, can fuse into those fibers and restore dystrophin expression. And this could be used in conjunction with uh, a gene replacement therapy or anything too. However, no safe and effective methods exist today to specifically target muscle stem cells, which is the goal of this project. Case in point, our <clears throat> most efficient genome editing approach uh, for uh, correcting dystrophin expression in skeletal muscle uh, leads to this widespread muscle dystrophin expression in all the muscles that we look at, and with up to 40 to 80 percent of dystrophin being restored in these muscles. However, if we sort for satellite cells and we analyze the dystrophin gene uh, for uh, mutation correction, we see that we have less than 0.01% correction using our CK8 regula uh, CK8E regulatory cassette, which is not expected to be active in satellite cells. So we decided to go after this in two ways. Uh, either go after resting or quiescent stem cells that express this uh, gene PAC7, or go after active and proliferating stem cells that express PAC7 and MyOD. So we screen these genes for conserved regions that are enriched for uh, myogenic transcription factor binding sites. And we came up with a series of different regulatory cassette candidates that we tested. These were uh, added into a construct for a reporter gene and barcoded, and then packaged into AAV vectors, which we pulled and delivered into uh, dystrophic and wild type mice, from which after a certain period of time, we isolate the muscle stem cells and extract DNA and RNA to quantify the uh, uh, activity of these regulatory cassettes in relation to each other. We got some really promising results. Uh, first of all, we see that our AAV in this case was a myotropic AOV that we could target between 15 to 20% of the satellite cells. And that we got some interesting, um, uh, some good, good results here as some uh, regulatory cassette candidates, both from the myod based ones and uh, also for the PAC7-based ones. Currently, we're mo moving ahead and, and we're analyzing these uh, promising regulatory cassette candidates for actually editing the dystrophin gene in these mice. And future studies should uh, uh, consider uh, developing more stronger and more dynamic regulatory cassettes that would enable both editing in existing muscle and stem cells, as well as to improve the delivery of genes to satellite cells. And this is the team uh, that has been working on this over the past two and a half years. Uh, so, and with that, I'd say uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Nicholas. Now we'll hear from Dr. Donshen Duan from the University of Missouri. Dr. Duan. Hi, uh, I want to start with thanking the 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 uh, David Duxing and the, the previously Jesse John uh, for the support to all our research. Uh, my lab has been focusing on developing adenal associated viral space gene therapy for Duxing. And uh, uh, as most of you know that uh, AV vector uh, is currently being used in multiple clinical trials uh, to treat uh, uh, Duxing muscular dystrophy and the several other neuromuscular diseases. And uh, AAV uh, is not just a single uh, uh, virus. It has many different flavors, different capsids. And so depending on the capsid that you used, you may get different uh, gene transfer efficiency. So the currently, uh, the, we use the AAV8, AAV9, or AAVI74 uh, because they perform the best in the mouse muscle but whether they are going to be efficiently transduced to human muscles and uh, whether they're the best to transduce human muscles is yet unclear. So with the support of the uh, Defeat Duxing uh, Canada, so we have uh, developed a platform to uh, determine uh, which uh, AAV uh, capsid will outperform in human muscles. And uh, we uh, presented or uh, data in American Society of Gene Therapy uh, 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 annual meeting. And we have identified uh, several candidates that outperformed the uh, current uh, uh, AV uh, uh, capsid that, uh, that were used in clinical trials. And we're hoping that uh, those uh, human tropic, human muscle tropic,
uh, AV uh, capsid uh, would be able to allow to achieve uh, efficient human muscle transduction at a much reduced dosage and therefore get a similar therapeutic efficacy without uh, uh, causing uh, side uh, uh, effect. Uh, thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Duan. We also have two other researchers who weren't able to join us tonight, but have sent through video updates. Those video updates will be available in the recording of tonight's event. Once again, we want to remind you that should you have any questions, please email us with any of those, and we will direct them to the appropriate researcher for a response. It's now my pleasure to introduce the chair of our Research Funding Advisory Committee, Dr. Lisa Hoffman, who will share the momentous milestones achieved this year and announce the new research grant recipients. Dr. Hoffman. Thank you, Rick. It's my honor to continue to serve such a wonderful organization and share in the celebration of this year's research milestones. In March, 2023, we opened the call for research applications and received 21 projects from seven countries, including requests from Canada, France, India, Israel, Japan, the UK, and the USA. Through the rigorous nine-month process, we then narrowed down our recommendation to five highly deserving scientists who you'll hear from tonight. With the researchers currently in years two and three of their funding, plus our new five recipients, Defeat to Chan Canada is investing over $880,000 this year. And as you heard before, while science is the method behind our mission, there would be no progress without people like you. Donations from our community and the stories behind them are the only reasons we have been able to fund the life-changing research milestones you'll hear about now. It's my great pleasure to introduce the first of five new grant recipients, Dr. Leanne Ward from a Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, or CHEO, in Ottawa, Ontario. Defeat to Chan Canada will fund two clinical fellowships in Duchenne Endocrinology and Bone Fragility in collaboration with Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy in the United States. Dr. Ward, over to you. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be the recipient of this award. And I'll just share my screen just to highlight a few aspects of what we're studying. Go. So I'm a clinician researcher. So I've been taking care of boys uh, with Duchenne muscular dystrophy for a number of decades now. And my goal is to optimize outcomes in Duchenne muscular dystrophy by minimizing side effects from classic steroid therapy and understanding the way in which other novel therapies in Duchenne are helpful in terms of endocrine and bone health aspects. So we know that the dystrophinopathy can cause osteoporosis, that is bone fragility, as well as short stature. And then glucocorticoids or steroids, which are the standard of care for the treatment of Duchenne, amplify the risk of bone fragility amplify the short stature and also cause delayed puberty, adrenal insufficiency, and excess weight gain. And these comorbidities of glucocorticoid therapy can significantly impact the quality of life of the individual living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. So what we want to do is optimize the treatment of Duchenne by minimizing glucocorticoid side effects so that boys can get the best possible outcomes with their Duchenne targeted therapy. So we're looking at this very rapidly changing therapeutic landscape in Duchenne in order to understand the way different treatments impact the endocrine and the bone health systems. We're looking at the impact of dystrophin restoration therapy, disease modifying therapy otherwise, and then classic steroids as well as the novel dissociative steroid vomorolone and the way that that impacts the endocrine and bone health outcomes. So we have train, uh, training fellowships that we've received from Defeat Duchenne Canada in collaboration with Parent Project Muscular Dystrophy. This funding will go to advanced trainees 
who will carry out clinical research fellowships, which mean the work with me in the clinic and understand how to best care for boys with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And they'll work with me on clinical studies in order to continue to understand comorbidities in Duchenne and how we can develop optimal strategies in order to improve outcomes. Thank you very much. And again, it's a real honor to be the recipient of this award. Thank you, Dr. Ward. It's now my pleasure to introduce the second award recipient and someone we know very well, Dr. Ronald Cohen from the Hospital for Sick Children, Sick Kids in Toronto, Ontario. His project titled Combinatorial CRISPR-Cas9 Mediated Duplication Removal and Glucocorticoid Treatment in a Humanized Mouse Model of a DMD Duplication. Dr. Cohen's lab is investigating a novel approach to editing a mutation in the dystrophin gene, the root cause of Duchenne, and looking to simultaneously increase the production of dystrophin protein, which is lacking in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Dr. Cohen? Thank you so much, and thank you everyone for joining us tonight, but most importantly, thank you for supporting all of our research. Um, I often say organizations like yours that allow us scientists to think outside the box and try things that maybe federal funding would initially deem as too risky is something that you allow us to do and that often leads to very, very promising results. So thank you for all your support. I'm going to briefly give you an overview of what we have been doing and continue to do and <clears throat> what this year's funding is going to extend in terms of the research that we are doing. So our laboratory is focusing mostly on duplications as the second most common of Duchenne mutations. And they present a unique therapeutic challenge as they're, for example, not amenable to some of the anti sense <clears throat> oligonuclear therapies that you have heard about. So several years ago, we have developed a methodology using the CRISPR genetic scissors, how we call them, to remove with one guide um, <clears throat> uh, the duplicated portion of, of a mutation in the dystrophin gene. And as you can see here, you can use one guide that cuts out a piece in the normal piece of dystrophin and in the abnormal piece of dystrophin and then gives you a wild type, normal, fully functional uh, dystrophin gene. And we have tried this in a duplicated mouse model of an exon 18 to 30 um, <clears throat> Duchenne model. And as you can see here in the middle, we were fairly successful in increasing the, the expression of what we call wild type dystrophin. This, this is full length dystrophin that's expressed, which is different than some of the gene therapy trials that are currently ongoing that use a smaller version of dystrophin. However, as you can see, while the expression looks promising, we were thinking about what could we do to further enhance the expression of dystrophin. And we can use the CRISPR system in two ways. The way how I just showed you, that you use a guide and you cut out the duplicated portion of the dystrophin gene that gives you a full-length normal wild-type dystrophin gene. But you can also inactivate the scissors of the CRISPR-Cas9 machinery. And what you can do without the scissors is you can target what we call the promoter, which is kind of the area of the gene that forces the expression of the gene product. And you can enhance dystrophin expression that way. And that's exactly what we have done. So we had on one side, uh, the scissors, and on the other side, a non-scissor CRISPR project, and a CRISPR product that helps you to increase further the dystrophin expression. We did a proof of concept experiment where we injected this in just a single mouth <clears throat> muscle right here. We waited five weeks, and we were quite excited to see that you can see here, if you just cut out the dystrophin duplication, you get certain amount of dystrophin expression, but if you add on this non-cutting uh, product of CRISPR-Cas9, you can actually increase the expression even further. So what I cannot show you 
quite yet because we are still analyzing these mice how this looks like if you give a systemic injection that would try to reach all muscles so if we're going to have this wonderful event next year i promise i'll show you how that looks like now <clears throat> for this year's competition what we are focusing on is trying to create a mouse model that would be really the closest possible model before we can go into a clinical trial. So what, am I, what do I mean by that? When we are thinking about gene-correcting therapies, and we are trying to correct certain mutations in a mouse, while this is, as a proof of principle, quite important and necessary to demonstrate, as you can see here, there are certain portions within the dystrophin gene that are different between a mouse and between a human. So all the purple areas show you that there are differences, which shows you that whatever you do in a mouse may not be necessarily 100% translated into a human. So what we have tried to do, and successfully tried to do now, is to create a mouse that has a human copy of the dystrophin gene. Now, almost 20 years ago, a mouse like this was established in the Netherlands, and a couple of years ago, we figured out that this mouse is actually not kind of the human, uh, doesn't really carry a human dystrophin gene the way that would allow us to do the experiments because it actually had two copies of the gene, as you can see here. So what we had to do in order to create a mouse that would really provide us the opportunity to have a true preclinical model is we had to remove with CRISPR-Cas9, the same way how we did this in the other mouse, this duplication to then come up with one single copy of the human dystrophin gene in the mouse. And finally, after a lot of work, we have this mouse. It's a healthy mouse. So you're looking now at a healthy muscle of a mouse that carries one copy of the human dystrophin gene. And that now positions us extremely well to do lots of different experiments. We are going to create duplication mutations on this human part of the dystrophin gene. We're gonna analyze these mice, and then obviously we are going to go back and try our uh, CRISPR-Cas9 approach that I showed you before. Plus, we are going to do this in combination with either steroids or one of the newer drugs that you probably have heard about, Bamorolaron, which is a steroid-like drug that has a less side effects though. So we are really trying to create the most closest preclinical situation to humans. And we hope that if the results of these studies are going to give us what we anticipate to see, that we are able to then really think about how to start a clinical trial with these products. So thank you again. I wanna just mention uh, this young gentleman Matthew Rock, who is doing most of the experiments, and a new graduate student, Lucy, is going to continue some of the work. Thank you again for your support. We really couldn't do it all without you. Thank you, Dr. Cohen. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Natasha Chang, a researcher Defeat to Shan Canada has previously mm -hmm. funded with great interest from McGill University in Montreal, Quebec for her project titled Inducing Stress Granule Formation in Muscle Stem Cells to Treat DMD. While not targeting the root cause of Duchenne, Dr. Chang is investigating compounds that could potentially improve muscle strength and slow down the progression of the disease, regardless of the type of mutation. Dr. Chang, the floor is all yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen. And just to confirm, you can hear me okay and you're seeing the right screen? We are, thank yes. you so much. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to, again, um, say thank you so much to Defeat Duchesne Canada, especially to the Research Funding Advisory Committee and the Duchesne Family Advisory Committee for um, their continual support of our research program. And it's really an honor to be presenting our, our project to you tonight. Um, so in my lab um, at uh, McGill University, um, my lab is really focused on studying the biology of these um, muscle stem cells, which you've heard about tonight. They're also called satellite cells. 
So these are highly specialized cells residing in the muscle tissue. Um, and that's this cell that's shown here on the right hand side um, that were first discovered and described in 1961 by uh, Alexander Morrow. And you can see in this schematic that they are uh, really a rare uh, population of cells that are sitting on top of muscle fibers. And these cells are um, critically responsible for sustaining the regenerative capacity of our muscles throughout life. And so in the lab, we're interested in understanding how these cells are maintained both in the context of uh, health as well as in uh, disease. And so in the lab, we use different approaches to study these muscle stem cells, and I will show you some of our data um, for each of these approaches today. So on the left is um, what we call an in vitro differentiation assay, where we look at the fusion of uh, stem cell derived muscle progenitor cells into these multinucleated uh, structures called myotubes. So these are the mature uh, muscle cells that are in our tissue. And in the image on the top, we're looking at uh, muscle stem cells that are cultured on top of an isolated myofiber from a hind limb muscle uh, from mice. And then on the far right, we are looking at a cross section of a regenerating muscle and we can stain for different uh, muscle stem cell and progenitor populations and get a sense of how well the muscle is regenerating by measuring these uh, different parameters um, such as muscle fiber size. And so um, a main uh, research focus in the lab is how are muscle stem cells affected in uh, Duchenne muscular dystrophy? And there are um, uh, in the literature increasing evidence showing that these stem cells, which are lacking uh, dystrophin expression in this disease, how they are impacted and how they don't behave the same way as normal and healthy muscle stem cells do. And so, um, in the lab, this is how we, we think about uh, DMD and, and really in essence, we think of it as this two-pronged disease where the absence of dystrophin um, in the muscle tissue leads to uh, muscle fiber um, uh, instability resulting in myofiber damage, but that the lack of dystrophin in the muscle stem cell um, uh, also uh, is contributing to this disease. And so, um, we view DMD as both a disease of the mature muscle as well as a stem cell disease. Um, and so really the rationale for our project um, came from previous work that was done in the field of muscle wasting um, uh, in cancer-induced cachexia, which is a, a, a severe muscle wasting disorder. Um, where treatment of both uh, cells and uh, mouse models of uh, cachexia um, with a drug that induced formation of these cellular entities called stress granules resulted in improved uh, muscle differentiation and function. And so we asked a very simple question, would this work in uh, DMD cell and animal models as well? And so, um, as I mentioned, stress granules are these types of uh, cellular structures um, that are known as MRNP granules. And um, what we know about mRNP granules is that they actually play an important role in stem cell differentiation. Um, and so our hypothesis is that if we can drive the formation of these stress granules, uh, we um, would be pushing the stem cells towards differentiation. And so that's exactly what we, we saw. So here's an example of that um, uh, in vitro um, differentiation assay where we treated uh, DMD myoblast progenitor cells uh, with compounds that induce stress granules and performed uh, this differentiation assay. And what we see is improved uh, formation of these myotubes uh, upon treatment uh, with these uh, compounds. Uh, and then of course, we also looked at the muscle stem cells. So these are cultured on top of single myofibers. These are fibers isolated from DMD mice. And here, what we're looking for is the ability of stem cells to turn on muscle differentiation markers. Um, so that's myogenin here, shown in green. And what we found was that treatment with these compounds resulted in an increase in the number of these green cells. So that means that we were seeing an increased differentiation in DMD muscle stem cells with this compound. 
And so finally, we have some really exciting uh, pilot data in DMD mouse models. So here we're using the commonly used um, MDX mouse model, um, and we're trying to find the right dosage uh, for the compound. And what we found was that with the compound, we we're seeing improved regeneration, and we were able to measure this using different uh, types of measures, including um, uh, staining, as well as measuring fiber size. And so um, our current uh, uh, research project that um, was just funded will continue these studies. So we're looking at um, examining the um, uh, exact expression of these mRNP granules and these genes that regulate uh, stress granule formation in single cells from uh, um, uh, uh, DMD mice, um, uh, muscle stem cells isolated from DMD mice. And really we are interested in understanding what is the molecular mechanism behind this compound? How is inducing stress granules able to um, enhance uh, myogenic differentiation? And most importantly, we are going to continue our studies in um, our DMD mouse models, but also using uh, patient derived uh, cells to validate our findings. Uh, I want to acknowledge my uh, research team at McGill University. So this is these are really the people that are driving the work. Um, these are the, the members of my lab. I also want to thank um, my partners for partnering with me in this work. So Stem Cell Network uh, in Canada and the McGill uh, Regenerative Medicine Network that um, are, are, are partnering with me in this research. Um, so finally, I want to thank also our uh, collaborators that have supported this project. Uh, these are the different funding agencies that support different aspects of research in my lab. And again, these are, are the names of the um, uh, research uh, team members of my lab. So thank you again very much uh, for giving us this opportunity. Thank you, Dr. Chang. I will now introduce the fourth recipient and someone we also know very well. Dr. Jacques Tremblay from Laval University in Quebec City, Quebec. For his project titled In Vivo Correction by CRISPR Prime Editing of Mutations Responsible for Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy, Dr. Tremblay's lab is also investigating a novel approach to edit mutations in the dystrophin gene, again, the root cause of Duchenne. Specifically, his group aims to increase the frequency of correction of point mutations in the dystrophin gene both in DMD myoblast and in mouse models. Dr. Tremblay, over to you. Well, thank you very much for giving me the occasion of presenting my research project, and thank you for the grant that will support this uh, research project continuation. Uh, there are different types of mutation which are responsible for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. About 30% of the, the, the our point mutation, that is a change of only a few nucleotides, and although there are thousands of nucleotides in the human genome, uh, the change of only one nucleotide can sometimes lead to an edit steady disease such as Duchenne muscular dystrophy. 60% of the mutation in Duchenne muscular dystrophy are deletion of one or several exons, and this change of the reading frame, and there is a premature stop codon that will be encountered in the following exon, and again, there is no functional dystrophin protein. So we are using the CRISPR-Cas9 technology. For those who don't know CRISPR, it's clustered regulatory interspace short palindromic repeat. And this has been used by bacteria for thousands of years, millions of years, to fight a virus. In 2012, this system uh, was also shown to be able to cut the genes in plant, in animal, and in humans. And therefore, in 2020, uh, the Nobel Prize of Chemistry was given to Doudna and Charpentier for their work. And as of today, there are 45,493 articles on CRISPR. In fact, this CRISPR-Cas9 technology use a protein which is called Cas9 nuclease. This protein is able to induce double strand break. It's able to cut both strand of DNA. And to it indicate where this double strand break has to occur, the system use a guide RNA, which target a sequence of 18 to 20 nucleotides in a DNA. 
this targeted sequence has to be followed by a protospacer adjacent motif, which is called a PAM, which is NJJ uh, for the Cas9 uh, of the Streptococcus pyogene, which was the first Cas9 used uh, for the CRISPR system. So whenever there is a complex form between the Cas9 nuclease, the guide RNA, and the DNA, then a double strand break, that both strands of DNA are cut at exactly three nucleotides from the PAM. Uh, when there is a double strand break in the DNA, there's two mechanisms of repair. One is called non-homologous enjoining, and this results in micro deletion or micro insertion of a variable number of nucleotides. And therefore, this is not a good way of repairing the dystrophic gene because most of the time, this would make a gene non-functional if the number of nucleotides which are deleted or inserted is not the adequate number. An alternative form of correction is the homology directed repair. Uh, and this permits to introduce a sequence of nucleotide that may be just a few nucleotide or a complete gene at a very precise localization in the genome. However, uh, such repair are very rare. This can be done in cells and culture, but it's not effective enough to be able to dream that this would be done in vivo to correct the dystrophin gene directly in patients. So fortunately, in 2019, there was a new development, a modification of the CRISPR technology, a modification which is called the prime editing technology. Instead of using a Cas9 nuclease, it's using a Cas9 nuclease, which cuts only one of the strand of DNA. And this Cas9 uh, nuclease is fused with a reverse transcriptase. This is another enzyme which permits to synthesize a strand of, of DNA from our, an RNA template. And this system, instead of using a single guide RNA, is using a peg RNA for prime editing guide RNA. And this is a modified single guide RNA. It still contains a sequence which target 18 to 20 nucleotide in the genome. And then this is followed by the constant part of the single guide RNA. And then there is two additional sequence which are added to the single guide RNA. One is called the primer binding site. It's a sequence of about 10 nucleotide that target the strand of DNA that has been released by the cut of the DNA by the nicase. And this primer binding site is followed by another sequence, which is called the reverse transcriptase template. And this is the RNA strand that will serve as a template for the reverse transcriptase to synthesize a new strand of DNA. What is important is in this reverse transcriptase template, we may change a few nucleotides in this uh, slide here, the nu few nucleotides that are changed are in red, and this will indicate what nucleotide have to be included in the new strand of DNA, which is synthesized by the reverse transcriptase. This is the way that we can modify nucleotide in a precise gene at a precise position. Nuclei change only one, two, or three nucleotide exactly as we want. So uh, we have been using this technology to correct in vitro nonsense mutation in the DMD gene and trying to correct the reading frame shift caused by deletion or insertion. And so this technology permits not only to modify a nucleotide, but also permits to include or remove a specific nucleotide. So the initial experiments that we did with the prime editing technology we were able to correct about 5% of the point mutation of a DMD gene for cells and culture. And this was a bit disappointing, but we kept working on this technology and we have improved it. For example, here we have the correction of a premature stop codon in exon 59 of the DMD gene. Uh, in this case, the stop codon, the TGA sequence, uh, will stop the synthesis of the dystrophin protein exactly at that point. It's due to a mutation. It, normally, it should be a C in that position. And instead of having a C, we have a T. 
And therefore, to make this change to T into a C so that we have the normal codon for arginine, we first have to identify a PAM, which I remind you is an NJJ sequence, N being any nucleotide. So as you can see in the green, in the yellow square, we have identified a PAM, which is not far from the target uh, nucleotide to be modified. And then we have a protospacer sequence, which is the 20 nucleotide that have to be targeted by the peg RNA to be able to do the modification. So for each of the point mutation that we want to correct, we have to do that. We have to identify a PAM, which is not far. We have to identify a protospacer a sequence, and then we have to synthesize a peg RNA that will permit to introduce the mutation exactly at the site that we want. Oops. Okay, so using various uh, modification of the prime editing technology, such as adding an additional single guide RNA that induce a, a cut, a nick in the other strand of DNA that is not targeted by the peg RNA, or mutating the PAM to prevent uh, the loss of an already introduced uh, modification, we were able to introduce following a single treatment of cells and culture, 36% of correction of a, of a mutation. So eventually, uh, after uh, we, we realized that, uh, that the correction that we obtained depends on the distance between the nucleotide and the PAM that we have identified. And depending on that distance, we can obtain up to 60% correction of a point mutation in the DMD gene after a single treatment of cells in culture again. So we have uh, published our results and we have been able to modify several different point mutation in the DMD gene. We have put, published our results in four different articles. So the aim of the new defeat Shane Grant is to increase the frequency of corrections of point mutation. And uh, one of my students is currently at a meeting in Banff, and she reported to me that some researcher have reported a recent chemical modification of the PEG RNA, which makes the PEG RNA more stable because the PEG RNA is a sequence of RNA that can be degraded by the cell exonuclease. So a chemical modification of the PEG RNA increase uh, the, the resistance to the exonuclease and therefore increase the frequency of prime editing. So we are looking forward to try that. And a second objective of the grant is to correct the reading frame uh, due to deletion. And again, these experiments will be done in vitro in cells and culture. And we want to do these experiments in vivo. And so we want to correct the reading frame by inserting or deleting one or two nucleotide to, uh, or by modifying the splice acceptor as the splice donor in order to restore the normal reading frame of the dystrophin gene. So the main problem of, of gene therapy has been, and it's still, delivery, delivery, and delivery. So to deliver the component of the uh, prime editing technology, we unfortunately have to use two adeno-associated virus. We could use the myo-AAV, which is a very good serotype of AAV to target the muscle, but yet we have to use two AAVs and the, the production of these AAV for human clinical trial is extremely expensive and therefore gene therapy treatment are two to three million dollars per patient. So it's nice to develop gene therapy, but we have to develop gene therapy, which is affordable by the health system of Canada. And therefore we are working on the delivery of the prime editing component with the lipid nanoparticle. The lipid nanoparticle have been shown to be able to deliver messenger RNA. This has been used by Pfizer and Moderna for the COVID vaccine. And this has been very successful. We are also working on another delivery system, which is the extracellular vesicle. These extracellular vesicles are small particles of about 100 nanometer, 
which are produced by every cell in the human body. And therefore, they are extremely abundant in the human serum. They contain 10 to the 15 extracellular vesicle per, per liter. And we have been recently able to introduce the Cas9 nuclease protein inside the extracellular vesicle. We're still working to introduce the Cas9 nuclease fused with the reverse transcriptase. And finally, another method uh, that has been recently developed is called virus-like particle. It permits to deliver protein instead of delivering RNA. It's a modified retrovirus. So uh, our final aim of this type of research is, of course, to obtain the probation of Health Canada of a clinical trial of prime editing for Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And I would like to thank again the support of Duchenne muscular, uh, defeat Duchenne uh, for, for the grant. And this will permit us to continue this uh, research project. And what is very interesting with the, the modification of a nucleotide in, in a gene is there are about seven different, 7,000 different hereditary disease. A large percentage of these hereditary disease are due to a single nucleotide modification. So progress of the prime editing technology may eventually be a treatment, not only for Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but perhaps for other dozens of other hereditary disease. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Tremblay. I will now introduce the fifth and final recipient, a new researcher to defeat Duchenne Canada, working on some very innovative and futuristic work. Dr. Yoshizugu Aoki from the National Center of Neurology and Psychiatry in Tokyo, Japan, for his project titled Patient IPSC Derived Brain Organoids as the Model for Cognitive Phenotypes of Duchenne Muscular Dystrophy. While also not targeting the root cause of Duchenne, Dr. Aoki is building mini brains to identify when short dystrophins are most important and to understand the processes at synapses that change when shorter distribution proteins are lost. Dr. Aoki, the floor is yours. So hi, um, I'm actually, doc I'm Dr. Uh, Satya Prakash and I'll actually be speaking on behalf of both of us. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Great. Um, so I'm a co-recipient of this grant and I'll be re leading this project uh, in the lab. I'll just share my slides. Uh, is that okay? Yep. Yes. Yes. Great. Thank you so much. So um, it's really an honor to be invited today and to be a recipient of this grant. Thank you so much to Defeat Dishan Canada. And uh, it's great to be um, a new member to this community. I'm really looking forward to getting to know everyone over the next few years. So um, we are based uh, in Japan. So it's actually morning for us on Friday. So hello from tomorrow. Um, we're at the National Center of Neurology and Psychiatry um, Institute of Neuroscience. We're based little ways outside of Tokyo. Um, our department is actually uh, the Department of Molecular Therapy. And we um, collaborate really closely with the National Center Hospital, um, which sees many uh, individuals living with uh, Duchenne. And uh, this is really great because this allows us to collaborate really closely with the clinicians and uh, the patients and families. So it's a really great environment to be a researcher. And I'll talk a little bit in my uh, presentation later about how these collaborations have been really crucial to our research. So we've already had a back, bit of a background about uh, DMD and how the gene works, but as we're kind of going to be working on the brain-related disorders of DMD, I wanted to highlight the different variants that are really important. So, of course, the full-length dystrophin, or DP427, is expressed in the muscle and plays a really crucial role there, but it's actually also expressed in the brain in these regions that I've highlighted here. And in addition to that, a shorter version of dystrophin called DP140 is highly expressed in these regions as well, specifically during development of the brain, so before birth. And depending on where the mutation um, in the DMD gene is, you're either going to lose the full length dystrophin in the brain and of course in the muscle, um, or if you have it downstream of these uh, green regions, you're also going to lose it, uh, lose the DP140. So this um, affects up to around 30% uh, of patients and losing both 
um, the full length and the shorter version of the gene is going to lead to cognitive impairment. So this kind of impairment can be seen as autism spectrum disorder, memory impairment, learning and language disabilities. And of course, for the boys who get DMD, this can be um, uh, difficult for them to live a full uh, normal life. So really getting to uh, understanding this um, this portion of the disease is what our project is going to be focused on. So just to give a little bit of a background, we know that the full length dystrophin is expressed at synapses in the brain. So just to give an um, uh, a background on what this is, we know, of course, that neurons are the main cell type that make up the brain. And neurons communicate with each other through electrical signaling. And it's really crucial that the signaling is done in a balanced way. And this coordination is done via synapses. And in the brain, the full length dystrophin is expressed at the postsynaptic region. It works with a bunch of other proteins in a complex and allows um, the balanced signaling of these uh, neurons in the regions that are involved um, in the uh, fear of pro uh, memory processing, uh, memory, cognitive processing. And it's the imbalance of the signaling in these regions, cerebral cortex, hippocampus, amygdala, which leads to uh, these disorders being seen in boys with DMD. Now, the shorter form of the dystrophin, we know less about. So it's very similar in structure to the full length, which this means that we can't easily distinguish its protein function. Although looking at previous mouse models, we have been able to find that it probably plays a role in specific type of neuronal synapses called glutamatergic synapses or excitatory synapses. Although we don't know where it is in these uh, synapses exactly in the presynaptic region, the postsynaptic region. And this makes it difficult to understand how the imbalance um, is being mediated. Although, as I mentioned, we do know that DP140 is highly expressed during brain development. Its function is really unclear during this time point. Of course, it's very difficult for us to study um, human brain, du brain during brain development directly. So we really need a way of doing this until this point. Mouse have, mice have often been used as a model to study behavior and diseases. But as you can see from uh, the schematic diagram, the brains of mice and the brains of humans are actually very, very different. Human brains, of course, are much larger. They have increased complexity and much longer developmental periods. And if you look at this image down here, showing the kind of layers that you see in human brain versus the mouse brain, we have far more layers, up to six in the human cortex, and this is partially due to a much longer time period of development in which the cortical regions of the brain is expanded. And this is what allows humans to have higher processing ability, higher cognition that we most associate with humans. And mice are just maybe not the best model in order to study these processes. They do represent certain uh, altered social behavior and elevated fear response, which might be uh, associated with some kind of um, similar disorder seen in humans. But these processes really can't be perfectly compared in the developmental processes in the mice are absent in humans. So how can we study these? So um, our uh, lab for this project is planning to use brain organoids, um, which are these 3D um, kind of aggregate models of, of um, balls of cells, which are derived from patient stem cells, uh, and they represent specific regions of the human brain. Now, this is actually a really novel technique. It was first published around 10 years ago, but has been really kind of expensive and very uh, labor intensive um, uh, experimental technique, which is why uh, uh, now it's only becoming uh, more relevant. And we're hoping to really be one of the first labs in the world to do this. So another thing I want to showcase, which highlights the collaboration we have uh, at the National Hospital here in Tokyo uh, and our lab, is that many volunteers have um, donated their urine so that we can um, obtain urine-derived cells as a primary culture from these patients, a really non-invasive really non method, which um, is much easier for boys with dyshen to be able to donate rather than a skin biopsy uh, or taking blood, for example. And from these urine-derived uh, urine cells, we can perform a method called iPSC row programming, which converts these urine-derived cells into stem cells. From these, in the lab, we can make embryoid bodies, which are little balls of stem cells. And by exposing these embryonic stem cells to the right condition, combination of uh, chemicals in a dish, we can uh, 
force these embryonic uh, bodies to become cerebral organoids, ganglionic eminence organoids, hippocampal organoids, representing that part of the brain. Um, all of these regions, of course, are relevant to um, the DMD uh, uh, symptoms that we see in the brain. And here I'm just showcasing the um, uh, organoids that we have differentiated in our lab. So from stem cell point, making the ball of cells and making these uh, organoids with cortical folding that form spontaneously. We can also we also know, looking at specific markers using antibody staining, that synapses are expressed uh, in this model. So using this technique, using um, uh, stem cells from somebody who does not have DMD, we looked at the expression of uh, DP140, the shorter isoform and the longer isoform, to follow how the gene is expressed uh, throughout uh, development of these organoids. As I mentioned, we already know from previous data that the DP140 is highly expressed during development, and it has this kind of peak at around 10 weeks post-conception, um, around uh, 30 weeks before birth. And at the same time, the full length dystrophin is expressed, but to a lower level. And we were really excited to see that this pattern was replicated in our data as well from the organoids. So the DP140 kind of curves up, matching this little peak. And while the DP427 full length is turned on, it remains stable. So looking at this, we were really excited to see that this could be a great model for studying um, uh, using brain organoids to study DMD relevant brains. So as um, showcasing a couple of the um, experiments that we're really excited to do for this project. We'll be using um, iPSCs or stem cells from patients who have either lost just um, the full-length dystrophin gene or both the full-length and the shorter ice form. And we can see that these uh, patients don't have any expression, they're just flat line at zero, um, replicating what we expect to see. And we would like to examine if synapse formation is uh, affected. So in the lab, by making cerebral organoids and ganglion emin eminence organoids, we're going to treat the GE organoids with a uh, reporter, which is basically a um, little piece of DNA which can be delivered to the cells and uh, light up the neurons. We can then cut and fuse these organoids together and then look at whether, whether the uh, transport, um, <coughs> excuse me, uh, whether the um, uh, the axonal growth is affected, the formation of new synapses is affected, and whether this is uh, different based on whether we lose just the full length or both the full length and the shorter version of the isoform. This will allow us to um, identify potential uh, targets for um, uh, treating these uh, processes. And this is particularly important because we're looking right down at what's going on during development rather than in adult models, which is mostly what's been studied in mice up to this point. Uh, further on, we're also excited to be doing a single cell RNA sequencing experiment. So just to give a quick background of this, RNA sequencing is a technique which allows us to take a snapshot of gene expression that's occurring in cells at any one time. So this allows us to see which genes have been switched on, which are downregulated, which are upregulated, and then downstream analysis allows us to perform what we call pathway analysis to understand which processes have been disturbed. By looking at um, the organoids that have a DMD mutation versus those that are normal, we'll be able to identify which of these processes specifically have been misregulated in our DMD brain organoids. Single cell means that we can look at this gene expression change in individual cells in the organoids. So this is looking at the neurons, um, astrocytes, and pinning down which genes specifically are affected by the loss of um, a shorter and full length dystrophin. So finally, um, this um, grant will allow us to do really great work in establishing these organoids, establishing the uh, disease pathways which come with um, uh, the loss of DMD. But of course, as I mentioned, we are the Department of Molecular Therapy, and we're really um, already thinking about how we can use these models uh, to uh, further improve DMD therapies. So um, we're already thinking about collaborations with a longtime uh, collaborator of ours, Dr. Matthew Wood at the University of Oxford, and to use these organoids as a preclinical model to um, rebalance the um, unbalanced neuronal signaling that we see. So using um, an exon skipping method, which I'm sure many of you will be aware of, um, as uh, we've also been involved um, in many uh, clinical trials, including uh, Viltolarsen and uh, Brogadursen, which are in phase three and two 
clinical trials at the moment. We're planning to try to uh, perform exon skipping to restore the full length dystrophin and use this model as um, a way of restoring the balance that we see in neurons. So thank you so much. I'll just end the talk there. Thank you very much uh, for joining us and sharing your very interesting work. And congratulations and thank you to all of our new research grant recipients. Without you, there would be no hope, no future without Duchenne. From the entire community, thank you to you and your research teams for your dedication to the cause. So it looks like we don't have any time to open the chat for questions and answers with tonight's speakers, but I will like to remind you that you can always send your queries to info at defeatduchenne.ca to be put into direct contact with these brilliant minds. So thank you again to everyone. I will now turn us back to Lisa McCoy to conclude this evening's celebration. Thank you so much, Lisa, and thanks and congratulations to all our new grant recipients. We look forward to hearing about all your progress in the uh, coming years. Um, and I just before we, we go, I want to take a moment to just highlight that um, to date, Defeat Duchesne Canada has invested $17.73 million into the most promising Duchesne and Becker muscular dystrophy science. And this funding has been allocated um, to 61 projects throughout our 29-year history, bringing us one step closer to a future without Duchenne. You know, and you've heard tonight, research really is the road to hope. And while science is the method to our mission, there's no progress without people like you. Donations from our community and the stories behind them are the only reasons that we've been able to fund promising research like you've heard about tonight. Our founding family, the Davidsons, have been living examples of how far parents will go to fight for the lives of their children. And every donation received continues to fight for a brighter future for each and every family. So thank you so much again for joining us this evening. We hope you walk away with new knowledge and most importantly, hope for a brighter future. Um, this recording will be emailed to you next week, along with the press release, which we hope we'll sh you will share throughout your networks and with your local media. And finally, we encourage you to stay up to date on all the latest by subscribing to our e-newsletter at defeatdeshen.ca and joining the conversation on social media at Defeat Deshen. Thank you so much again to everyone who attended and participated tonight. And we hope to be in touch with you again soon. Have a great evening.